When Sega decided to launch its Model 3 and Naomi arcade hardware, they did so with a set of new arcade games based on real world professions. An ambulance, an 18-wheeler driver, firefighting, safari hunting, and many more. Despite the abundance of variety of these titles in the subgenre, only a very few select games made their way to consoles, and even fewer stayed relevant to time. Maybe they weren't good enough, maybe they weren't entertaining enough, or maybe they just weren't crazy enough. Because out of all of these, a simple taxi game would be the honored one and transcend time to be well revered and played to this day. It's Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Get ready. Game rated T for team. Oh uh, yeah, you know what it is. It's Crazy Taxi, Sega's arcade hit that asked the question, what if you could force your way out of traffic? Well, that is what the creator of Crazy Taxi was thinking when he got trapped in a traffic jam, while the other side of the road was completely empty. Such a simple question would lead to what on the surface would be a simple playing game. One where you drive around picking up people in a taxi and ignore the rules of the road as you take them to their location. But as you can see by the modern success of simple games like Lethal Company and Among Us, having a simple idea doesn't mean that your game doesn't offer much value. As players in the arcades in 1999 loved Crazy Taxi, more so than many of the rest of the job arcade titles that Sake was putting out. I mean, how many of them can you recall without looking at a Wikipedia page? And lucky for the players, the consoles have finally caught up to the intensive power of the arcade boards, starting with the Dreamcast. Crazy Taxi was made on the Sega Naomi arcade hardware, which is pretty much what the Dreamcast was made out of, allowing for a near arcade perfect experience for their port to their arcade games, and Crazy Taxi was no exception. So in early 2000, Dreamcast owners got to take the real arcade experience to the home with the release of the Dreamcast version of the game. However, while it's great to have a near-perfect arcade experience at home, was it worth it to sell the game at full price? And was it enough to keep up with the changing landscape of games that started with the previous generation of systems that pioneered 3D gaming? Hi, my name is Jay, and you're tuning in to the J Blast Network as we switch our gear to go on a ride to the past where games kicked ass as we look at Crazy Taxi! Crazy Taxi! Hey, 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 it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all I wanted to hear, the offspring. The first thing you hear when you build up a run of Crazy Taxi, as you pick up the first customer and hit the streets of not San Francisco. On the surface level, Crazy Taxi is a simple game. You pick up people, take them to their destination, and rinse and repeat. What makes it interesting is that you don't follow the rules of the road. In fact, it's encouraged to hop off hills, sway through traffic, and go off road to get to your destination on time. Each of these rewards you with tips from a passenger, adding to the total cash you earn from driving them off. You get more cash from dropping them off faster or less if you drop them off slowly. And if you suck or you just get screwed over by traffic and can't drop them off in time, you earn nothing, wasting the little time that you have. And time is very important. If you're playing on the arcade rules, you can keep extending your time by picking up customers. Each customer is highlighted by a color. If it's a dark red, then the customer will give you little time bonus but will have a closer destination. The lighter the color, the farther the destination. With light green giving you the most money, the most time and having the farthest distance to go. The trick is to mix and match the colors because just going out to a far destination isn't always ideal to boost your time, especially if you don't know the map. You want more money by the end of the run because it increases your rank. Now that don't get you nothing but bragging rights, but still, you want to be real good at the game to get the most out of it. Now that all sounds simple for an arcade game, but the genius of Crazy Taxi is what's under the hood, and I mean the mechanics that are under the hood. The mechanics of Crazy Taxi make the most difference when it comes to runs. The first impression would be that the taxi is hard to handle, and you might think this is because of the name. In reality, Crazy Taxi gives you a lot of control. Let's start out with the characters. You have four caddies to choose from. Alex. All right, let's get it on. He's the most balanced of the taxi drivers in all stats. My main man, BD Joe. BD Joe. Yeah, we 
gonna have some. He's the fastest out of the four, but has the worst handling. Gina. Gina. Okay, let's play. Cool. She has the best handling, but is also the weakest against collisions. And Gus. Gus. Okay, let's have some fun. He has the most power and weight, but is the slowest. Honestly, these stats do not matter much if you know the mechanics you are using. It only matters most of the time in the crazy box, which I'll talk about later. So really, pick whoever you want. Though me, I go with my man, BD Joe, and of course, that smooth thing, Gina. Now you see, what's gonna save you the most time isn't these characters, but it's the universal mechanics. In fact, I'd say that they are outright necessary if you wanna get better at the game. All of these techniques you use shifting between gears in order to pull them off. Mastering this is very very important. When you turn and switch between gears, you can perform the crazy drift, which helps cutting sharp corners. When you brake after switching to reverse, you can perform the crazy stop, which allows you to stop quicker than just holding the brake button down. And when you switch from reverse to drive and press the gas from a stop, you perform the crazy dash, which gives you a starting boost instead of a slow start and acceleration. Now those were the easy techniques, but there are two more that are more advanced to pull off and combine the previous techniques I just told you about. If you combine the crazy drift and the crazy stop, Stop, you can perform the crazy drift stop, allowing you to precisely stop out of a drift. This is one of the harder techniques for me to pull off precisely, so I just perform the regular crazy stop most of the time. Then there's the ultimate speed technique, the limiter cutter. This is the combination of repeating the crazy dash input after starting with a crazy dash, and it allows you to reach max speed as long as you don't hit anything. You will notice a significant difference when implementing all these techniques in your time, and I even say it's essential when going for the higher ranks. My only issue with these moves is that there isn't a lot of great indicators, especially for the boosting moves, that you pulled them off correctly. You just have to fill them out, which is why I think these moves aren't easy to master because you're not going to see a lot of cues outside of the crazy drift. And that's one thing that I think the game really should have improved on, especially in a home port when people are trying to learn the game's mechanics. Now even with knowing the mechanics, you still need to know the maps, even with an arrow leading you to your destination. In the home version of Crazy Taxi, there are two maps, the arcade map and the original map, exclusive to consoles. The arcade map is the first one and the best one, starting off driving down hills and including a mall, a downtown area, a baseball stadium, and Pizza Hut. Ah oh, yeah, this is one of the cool things about Crazy Taxi. It had real life locations in it. Now could this be seen as shameless product placement? Sure. But hey. Who cares? It's based on real life anyway, so it should have real life locations. It's all a part of the atmosphere, man. And I didn't even mention all of the iconic areas of the map, like drifting through the parking lot, park itself, and the church on top of the hill. And there's still more. No matter which way you're going on this map, it just flows. And you can appreciate that the more you get better at the game. The original map, in comparison, is a bit of a disappointment, with tons of elevation and not that many iconic landmarks. Look at this, look at all these hills, man. You can't even tell where you're going. What do they think I am, the Highlander? Nah, I said that for my boy Christopher Lambert. But in all seriousness, the elevation here just kills most of the map. The big thing here is the train and the train tracks and the waterfront at the bottom of the map. But because of all the hills you have to go through doing most of the map, it just makes it confusing to deliver customers to the right place. Even Arrow has a hard time trying to navigate this place. And while there is a downtown area like in the other map, along with real life places like KFC, the locations just aren't as interesting or as memorable as in the arcade map. I guess you can remember driving in the water a lot in the waterfront which is another crazy feature of the game but you can also drive underwater in the arcade map in the very few areas where you can drive underwater so that's not even that special to this map alone now for as much as i'm ragging on it the map isn't bad it's good to have more content in a home port in fact i say it's necessary to have it but i wish it kept the same flow as the base map the good thing about both maps though is that much like the skills it will take you time to master and how you progress them relying on the arrow alone isn't always ideal, especially in that second map, if you want to find the fastest route. You'll need to know the map layout and use the shortcuts to save on time. Now I've been on and on about skill and mastering the game, and that's just what comes with playing arcade games like this. But the difference between most arcade games and Crazy Taxi is that Crazy Taxi gives you a good tutorial to learn the game, even if it can be hard at times. 
This is where the crazy box comes in. A box full of missions that require you to use the moves at your disposal. And they even tell you how to use them for hints. It starts off small, like using the crazy dash to launch further off of a ramp, or just using the crazy drift to drift around circles. But as you get further into the missions, it gets complicated for what they want you to do. Like having to bowl using the crazy drift under its time limit, or using the crazy drift to fly off a corner so you don't land in the water under a time limit, or having to use the crazy start and crazy Crazy stop to deliver a bunch of grandmas to the edge of the waterfront under a time limit. And in general, have missions that require all your abilities in order to complete them under a time limit. The hardest ones being the ones where you have to deliver a certain amount of customers or pick up a bunch of customers and deliver them to all to one location under a time limit. As you notice, I keep repeating the word time limit because that is the name of the game. It's trying to teach you to do all this stuff really fast because you're not going to have time in the base game either. A smart yet frustrating move. You're going to find yourself restarting these missions a lot in frustration, but each time you will get better at the game one of the little interfaces of the mechanics so you'll be able to succeed. For instance, I was struggling on this bowling mission for a while until I learned I didn't have to lean that far into the crazy drift and I could do quick drifts so that I wouldn't turn all the way so I could get a strike on all the bowling pins. Or learning how to pick the right character for the right mission by using Gina's great handling for all these grandmas that I deliver on this narrow ass path. A solution the solution to each of these missions is always utilizing the mechanic under the crazy taxi's hood. And once you're done, you'll see the difference in how you play in the main game. Now all this culminates in the ultimate mission, where you have to loop the entire arcade map under a time limit using everything you know and the limiter cutter. You better learn how to use the limiter cutter, trust me, it will save your life on this mission. It tests your knowledge of the arcade map with your skills behind a taxi, and man it gets irritating when you get so close but you fail because you're one second off. But once you succeed, you can consider yourself a crazy taxi master. And it all comes with mastering your time. Now mastering your time in Crazy Taxi comes in two ways. You can play by the arcade rules where you can keep boosting your time every time you pick up a customer, or you can play by a certain time limit where you only have a certain time limit to get a certain score in the game. With the least amount being three minutes and the most amount being 10 minutes. Using the latter option is good to getting to know the map, but if you if you want the high scores, I would suggest playing on the arcade mode because if you play on the arcade mode, you can pretty much play this game forever if you're good enough. As you can see, the crazy boss can be very harsh conditioning, but it makes it worth its while when you see your rank increase in the main mode. And that's a feeling you wouldn't get without a mode that teaches you the game's mechanics like crazy box. And I can appreciate that about an arcade game, especially when the genre primarily prides on you not knowing enough to continue so you can put more quarters in. But that doesn't translate well when the game comes to console. And I'm thankful that the Crazy Taxi devs understood that. Now I can't mention Crazy Taxi without mentioning the soundtrack. Blasting your ears is bangers from the offspring and bad religion. My favorites being all I want and way down the line. I'd play it, but you know the YouTube striking system. And look, I love the soundtrack, but there's only like seven songs in the game. And you'll be hearing them on repeat a lot. And they're good songs, really good songs, but they're also very short because both of these bands make very short songs. So even me, who's a fan of both of the bands, starts to get a little tired of hearing the same song, especially when you have to keep repeating and restarting missions in the crazy box. And I'm sorry for saying that. I know it sounds like blasphemy to even get irritated by listening to some of this music to most of you, but the game could have really used more music. Heck, I think the first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater had more music than it, and it also had a small amount. All that may sound like blasphemy because people might say you should just be grateful to even hear it because the other crazy taxi ports just removed the music entirely. The footage that you've been seeing throughout the whole video is the Dreamcast version of the game. What some may say is the definitive version because it has all licenses, including the real locations. Also because the Dreamcast is basically the same as Naomi arcade hardware. But as we all know, the Dreamcast didn't have a long shelf life and Sega wanted to profit off of all those damn Dreamcast games and some of them even got sequels. Crazy Taxi would be ported to the GameCube and the PS2, but it came with more pop in and slowdown compared to the Dreamcast port. This wasn't because of the arcade hardware, but probably because this was a port of a port, a port of a Dreamcast game that was a port of the arcade game. And if you compare this to some of the 
the other Sega ports, even the best ones like Sonic Adventure 2, they all have some graphical issues or some small difference in the lighting. Something that just isn't the same. And it's not that these consoles couldn't replicate what the Dreamcast did, but it's just that when you're porting from one system to another directly, it's gonna cause some issues. Especially when you're porting so fast because your system was dying. But if these were the versions that you had to play, they weren't bad enough to not have to play them in the first place. You probably wouldn't even notice it unless you played the original. Now, okay, editor's note here. I tried to get footage of the PSP version to the PSP emulator, but unfortunately it was not working with me and it kept crashing. So the footage you're gonna be seeing is from the trailer and also the crashing footage just to prove that it was crashing. Sorry about that guys. I just tried to get the gameplay to show you guys the authentic version, but couldn't do it this time. The best port, in my opinion, is the PSP port. Crazy Taxi, Fair Wars. This port includes both Crazy Taxi 1 and 2, and also has multiplayer, which I probably won't have footage for. I'll try to get it. Hopefully, if it is there, it'll be on screen right now. But the multiplayer included three different modes. One mode lets you compete against other players to see who earns the most money on the same map. Another was pretty much the same thing, but you got to go one at a time for the highest score. And the last one had players go head to head on the same map to see who can steal each other's customers. This is something that the console ports really could have used for extra content, but it's only in the PSP version of the game, and unfortunately, it does control pretty funky because now you're on the PSP instead of a console. Oh, and the soundtrack? Yeah, it's gone. And so are the real locations. They're all gone, replaced with original content. However, since you're on the PSP, you can always insert music that you have and use your custom soundtracks from the PSP in order to get the original soundtrack back in the game. That's a very cool loophole that's allowed to happen. Now, the last port is the HD port. That is probably the most accessible version right now, releasing on the Xbox Live, PSN and Steam and also mobile devices as well as in a Dreamcast collection bundle. It's a good port that upscales the graphics but it also removes the licensed content but if you got it on Steam you can just model that stuff back in. If you aren't a purist you can honestly just play this port of the game without any issues but because the Dreamcast didn't cut content it really is the closest way to play the arcade version and it's also considered the definitive way to play the game but like i said you can't go wrong with the hd port or the psp port if you want a handheld version of the game it's really impressive for that system crazy taxi's legacy is undisputed as one of the best dreamcast titles and one of the best sega franchises in general and for the price you can get it for now i think it's more than worth it for that entry fee just to go a couple of rounds in the game However, if we're talking about back then when a Dreamcast was new, I don't know if this was worth the full price. Look, you really just got the arcade port with one new map and a couple of missions. Now, if you beat those missions, you get a new vehicle, which is the crazy bike. It's super fast, but that's it. Outside of mastery, the game doesn't have much to offer. When this game released back in 2000, it sold for 50 bucks. 50 bucks competing against other big games on the Dreamcast and other systems. And in the world that just had games like Sonic Adventure or Tomb Raider, or Need for Speed if we're talking about racing games, and many other games outside of this genre with more content, it's almost laughable how little here there is for that price point. I know the appeal is being able to play the arcade version at home, near perfect, but that era was dying. This wasn't the early 90s or the late 80s anymore, where games were much shorter and relied more on difficulty and mastery to beat them. Now games were larger filled with content for months in all genres, starting with the fifth generation of consoles. And not only was the arcade slowly dying, at least in the States at the time, but games that lived by it were dying too. I'm not saying that this makes the game bad, or that it's a bad port because of this, but what I am saying is back then, this game should have been much cheaper. And while it did sell well, they did end up getting a $30 price cut selling for 20 bucks near the end of its life, which I think was fair for back then. Crazy Taxi feels more like a companion piece to games like Sonic Adventure, Soul Calibur, or Jet Grind Radio that you would pick up on the Dreamcast. It can be appreciated more that way rather than being the only thing you have to just repeat. Now, Crazy Taxi wasn't the only Dreamcast game like this. In fact, I think that was a flaw of the library, was that it did have some really great arcade games, but at the end of the day, these were just straight arcade ports with not much to offer outside of the arcade mode when the industry was moving on. But having simple games like this with rich mechanics was still fun. It's still needed, but I just don't think it's something that can carry itself alone at such a high price point. Nowadays, the question is irrelevant because the game goes for much, much cheaper now, and arcade games like it are also going for much, much cheaper now when they're re-released. So you can just grab it and enjoy it for the little time that the game has to offer. And it's a great time ripping through the city, delivering all the people I can, pretending that I'm a taxi man like Bruce Willis. Sorry. You just had an accident. Yes, I know I just had an accident.
or taxi driver. And I think you would like it too if you dive deep in the crazy taxi and experience the hype of the late and great Dreamcast and its diversity that the Sega old heads like me preach about every day. Well, with that being said, this is the J Blast Network signing out. And don't forget, you better believe, baby. Yeah. Class license. Man, that was amazing driving. I'm sure you're gonna come by and show it to me again sometime, right? Here we go.